chorus again. I want to sing some harmonies. Bless the Lord. <laughs> no, no, give me the chorus again. Y'all got to be ready to improvise here. Give me the chorus. Bless, Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his home. your holy name. Amen. We do worship the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you think about this. In the, the church that I worked, worship, um, what did I do in Texas? They didn't even know it after four months. Wait a minute. Oh yes, it was a war zone. So the church that I worked at in Texas, they had a tradition of clapping all the time. And uh, they loved performance. You'll forgive me, I'm kind of a traditional guy. So I asked them, one time I sang, and they clapped. Really? And I asked them, did you clap for me or for Jesus? And you could see them get nervous. You get the point? I'm asking you to think. If you're going to clap, make sure you're clapping for Jesus, because never once have you clapped for my sermon. Never once. So with that in mind, we welcome you into the house of the Lord here at Bex Reformed Church. It is a place where Jesus Christ is the central focus of all that we are about. He's the one who has done it all, and we just have the privilege of being recipients of his grace and stewards of his grace as we pass it on to one another. And there's something that happens when we gather in community that we stimulate one another to good deeds according to Romans, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10. And also we would like, would like to welcome our extended family who are worshiping with us this morning online. It is important to, for you to know that we consider you part of this family. And you should also know that many of you join us, as you know, those of you online, at different times and different hours. I think some of you are watching me in your pajamas now or at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday. So in any case, figure this face is here for you. And uh, we thank you for joining us. Let me call your attention to the opportunities for fellowship and service that we have within our church family. You see the announcements that regularly scroll on the screen before service starts. Suzanne works on those, so please pay attention to them so that she is being well used and appreciated. I would also remind that Sunday school, which started up last week, post-COVID, and we're thinking on our feet, we're getting something done, and it was awesome last week. Would you agree? Would you like to applaud? I would too. That's right. So we're giving thanks to the Lord and appreciation to the folks who worked at that. So there will be a class here. There will be one in the Praise Center. There will be high schoolers in the corner, am I correct? Kids down below and whatever else is happening. We're thrilled to have it, so know that that starts at 10.45, I think it is. Am I correct on that time? Okay. Also, uh, Bex Bucks, and you know who you are. I want to talk to you after the service over there as we'll plan, get a plan for our thing, and the rest of you are wondering, what is a Bex Buck? Hmm, good. And then finally, uh, I want to remind you as well that the choir. We had our initial reconstituted choir practice, and frankly, we thought we sounded pretty good. Now, we were all singing in the Maxwell Smart cone of silence, so we couldn't hear one another. But nonetheless, we thought we were singing pretty good, because we had them scattered from there right on up into the attic over there. And uh, we were making it work. So we appreciate Kevin and anybody who has ever thought about singing with the choir. If you're comfortable in COVID world and all that goes with it, you got your mask, I got mine. Uh, you feel free to join us on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, OK? With that in mind, I would also encourage you to prepare our hearts for prayer. I was thinking of a little chorus that I learned in my first pastorate. I had never heard it before. It said, when you pray, will you pray for me? For I need his love and his care. When you pray, will you pray for me? Will you whisper my name in your prayer? There are folks that have scrolled on the screen and they're up there now. They're counting on your prayers. And there are others that are unspoken, and that may be you. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray to seek our Lord. Gracious God, in these moments that we spend together, we thank you and we praise you that this is a place where you are pungent, your presence is real, your grace is true. 
Thank you for each person who has made this a priority to be here both in person and online. We pray that we would find ways to meaningfully engage one another with the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ and his marvelous grace. Thank you for this hour of worship. Thank you for each person and the opportunities and the challenges that they face. Your grace shows through. Now, you know the prayer requests that we lift for before you of one another. And we thank you that we can be a party of bringing hope, encouragement, healing, and strength to, to those in need, be it spiritual, physical, financial, circumstantial. And we sometimes feel very frail and small when we lift those before you, but you know, and we thank you for your grace and goodness in that regard. We also would pray for our country and all that it encounters now, and the unrest and the division and the, the democratic process we have to go through. We're committing all of that into your hands, and we're praying because your word tells us expressly to do so. In this hour, Lord, may we walk out of here having been touched in a deep and meaningful way, sensing an impact within our hearts and lives that we then can take out and share in the homes and hearts and lives of others. And now continue to lead us as you, we pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, glory forever. Amen. The first song we have today, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, but it has a, a different chorus with it. Uh, the, the new chorus with it, uh, the words are, Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King, Come Thou Precious Prince of Peace, Hear Your Bride, to You We Sing, Come Thou Fount of Our Blessing. And then the very last, and it follows with the whole theme of everything we're doing today, the very last line in the whole song, the whole hymn, now your grace is always with me and I'll never be alone. Amen.
Please read in unison from the screen the Apostles' Creed as an affirmation of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we present the offering and our lives to God as we sing the doxology. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for all the many blessings, the, the offerings and the tithes that we share. We just want to thank you for being a part of Bex. And we just ask that you continue to guide and direct us as we go our future ways. And uh, we just want to thank you again. Amen. Good morning again. I'm going to read uh, Second um, Second Timothy chapter four verses one through five. In the presence of God and of the Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the mirror, in the view of His appearance and His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in the season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and be careful instructions. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, their suit is their own desire. They will gather around their and great numbers of teachings that will say what their teaching, what their itching ears want to hear. They will then turn their eyes away from the truth and turn aside to the myths. But you keep your head in all the situations, endure hardships, do the work of the Lord, and evangelize and discharge all the duties of your ministry. 
the word of the Lord. Thank you. Check two, three. All right. Now listen, I want to tell you something before I sing this song. And you see I've got some help this morning. I'm excited. Now that said, um, this sermon series that you've been engaged with for five weeks with me, as I was months ago at home in the balmy trade winds, oh my, it's going to get me tired. As I was preparing all that I was going to do here, I was working on this sermon series, Confidence in the Crisis. And in the seed of it, there's always a, a concept or a seed that sparks your mind and you run from there. And it was out of the book of Hebrews where it says, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul. I want you to just think about your soul being anchored. And then as I thought on further, the Lord was poking my heart in Hebrews 3, if we hold fast our confidence of this hope. And then Hebrews 10, don't throw away your confidence. So you hear those two verses in particular. Hold fast our confidence. Don't throw away your confidence. So my plan was, okay, I'm going to preach a sermon about that. And let me find some other sermons to go with it. And this will be the grand finale. I've never been able to get a sermon out of that couple of verses except this. So this is going to be the shortest sermon you've ever heard. But don't get your hopes up. i got another and I'm going to give you but this is, here we are, Hebrews 3. Hold fast our confidence. Hebrews 10. Don't throw away your confidence. And here's the sermon. Hold on to your confidence. And when you can't do that, let your confidence hold on to you. I want to share with you an old song called A Haven of Rest featuring my friend Tina.
of that fun, let's get on down to the hard part, shall we? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word and for the opportunity that I have to open the bread of life to our brothers and sisters, hungry sheep who come to not only be fed, but then to go forth and serve and live. And we thank you that what we've just considered, an, our hope as an anchor of the soul, is not just a fancy idea, but a living reality. We give you this time now that we spend together in your word and avail ourselves for your spirit to move in wonderful ways that only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Which makes a greater impact? A first impression or a last? A grand entrance or a showdown scene? Here's Johnny or... Here's looking at you, kid. For some of you in the room, that's called Casablanca. Google it. I want to speak to you this morning upon the theme, singing a sweet swan song. Did you hear the scintillating uh, telephone announcement that we send out on Fridays when Suzanne does this? I tease her. I say, hello, this is Suzanne calling from Beck Church. And so she, she, we had to do two or three takes on that. She goes, sing a sweet, 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 sweet. So singing a sweet swan song. And nobody sang it better than that legendary country artist, George Strait. I'm sure you're a fan as I am. When he sings, this is where the cowboy rides away. Swan song. You know the phrase. That final act of life. It seems that little Johnny was living in the house and big brother Jimmy was attending university, going to college, but he was living at home. And little Johnny would go up into the room and bug, bug big brother Jimmy all the time. And Jimmy would say, get out of here, I'm studying. He'd come up the next time, what are you doing? Get out of here, I'm studying. Next time he went up and he says, brother, what you doing? And Jimmy said, get out of here, I'm cramming for finals. Okay, so he went away. Well, about two months later, Grandma moved in to live with him. It was that time of life. And so Grandma moved in to live with him, and little Johnny went into her room one day, and he saw her reading her Bible. He went down home, downstairs, told Mom and Dad. He says, Mom, Dad, I saw Grandma upstairs cramming for finals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not so funny, is it? At issue is facing facts with fortitude, aging, balding, firing, failing, divorcing, dying, facing facts with fortitude. The Apostle Paul lets us see, we get a window into his soul as we get to see and hear his final act and last words. We don't always get to see those with someone. It is found in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. You heard Blair read the first part of that chapter. I will pick up and you will see it on the screen. Paul then writes beginning in verse 6. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. and The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Like it or not, each one of us will cue up our final swan song, our last exit. May I ask you, would you like to have paramount confidence in the ultimate crisis? Did you hear those extraordinary adjectives? Would you like to have paramount confidence in the ultimate crisis? I'm going to suggest to you how you can from this passage of Scripture, God's Holy Word. We'll find it starting in verse 6. There are three principles. Here's the first one in verse 6. And that is a awareness of the situation. Awareness of the situation. Now the context of this passage that Paul writes about is peril. He is in a clear and present danger. Look at verse 6. Keep your Bibles in front of you. For I am already being poured out 
as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. This is a man saying, it's crunch time, I'm going to kick the bucket, I'm going to buy the farm. Is there any part of that we don't understand? That's what he's saying. Now, we, under, we have to put it in its context of the, whenever you're studying the Bible, you always look at the, the context of which it was written. When, who wrote it, to whom, why, etc. What's the dates? The date is probably 65 AD, according to scholars working on this. For it, it's from Rome. It was in 66 AD that Nero's maniacal persecution of anybody, but convenient scapegoat being the Christians, rose to its zenith. He burns the city of Rome and, in fact, Christians at the stake in order to make a scapegoat and put the blame on them for what he had done. It is just shortly before that that Paul finds himself in prison a second time in Rome. And while there, he composes his last letter to the young pastor Timothy, whom he has left at Ephesus. And as he is writing, he is saying, this is it. It's as tough as it's ever going to get. You want to talk about a crisis, Timothy? I'm in one. Within the last 10 days, I heard it again. I don't know where it was, maybe in the media somewhere, where someone uttered the phrase, Christianity is a crutch. Perhaps over the course of your lifetime, you've heard someone say, that, well, Christianity is a crutch. Maybe even some of you in this room have said, well, Christianity is a crutch. Well, let's think about that for just a moment. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be fair to say that every one of us in life at different times needs a crutch? I mean, I don't care who you are or who you think you are, you're going to need a crutch or certainly a walker. And so when tough times come that you just don't have what it takes to cope with that, you better find some help. Now, this world will tell you, let me suggest, this world says, let me suggest some crutches for you to get through. Drink this, smoke that, do that. Have that diversion, whatever it may be. What do those do? Those crutches offer you a way to dull the pain, to go around it. But the gospel understands when Jesus is about building character in you and me, he is about building us strong and firm on the inside. Here's a little geometry lesson. What is the shortest distance between two points? A straight line. And the gospel of Jesus Christ enables us to face our own frailties, faults, and failings, yes, even sin, that may have put us in this mess, and says, I've got to face those head on and deal with it. The gospel enables us to walk right through the middle of the challenge we face in life, of the crisis we endure, instead of going around it. It was Jesus, when he was presented with Calvary's Hill, who did not take a circuitous detour, but rather walked straight up Calvary's Hill. And I want to share with you that 40 year, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, I was in a major life crisis. And I can testify that I, like anyone else, thought about my options. What are other ways to cope with this pain and make it go away? But I'm here to testify that the grace of God enabled me to walk right through the middle of that horrific season in my life. And I'm standing here today because Jesus wouldn't let go of me. As children of God, we do not live or die in denial. We grasp the words of the immortal Clint Eastwood, a man's got to know his limitations. We already grab hold of that. And so we discover, first of all, that paramount confidence is held tightly with a firm, gris, firm grasp of reality. Christians don't whistle in the wind. We don't believe in pie in the sky. We face the facts. So let me say it one last time. Paramount confidence is held tightly with a firm grasp on reality. The second principle for paramount confidence is found in verse 7, and this is a self sense of accomplishment. A sense of accomplishment. Listen to verse 7. This man who is in prison to be executed says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. When my mother died at age 86, 
went to her funeral, of course. And without my awareness, she had planned her funeral. I did not perform her funeral. Her pastor did. And he, he shared with us that her chosen verse of scripture was what I just read. I've fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. And I was encouraged to hear that being spoken about my mother, that she had chosen that. For you see, my mother was a simple woman. She was not highly educated. She worked physically every day. That was her job. Um, she had never done things that this world would hold in high esteem, but she had been a good wife. She had been an incredible mother to four sons. And it's fascinating, when we sons will get together now as adults, we will be thinking and speaking about goals and values and lifestyles and so forth. And one of my older brothers, who is very, uh, shall we say, blunt, uh, he will say it this way. He'll talk about our, the values that we as Hankins men now have. And he will say, you know, those old people, they had it figured out. They were right. They raised us with stuff that really matters. And I say to him, who are you calling old? We're the same age of what you're talking there. Because he's in his 70s. But we're affirming what mom was all about. She loved the Lord. She served the Lord. And she lived for the Lord. I saw it. In John chapter 17, it's an amazing prayer, and you should spend time with it. That's where Jesus is now at the end of his ministry, just getting ready to go to the passion, the resurrection, etc. So he takes a moment to stop and reflect and look back over his efforts and think forward of what happens when I hand this whole mission of redemption over to my disciples and you and I. So Jesus is, is having a strategic planning time there in prayer. And one of the things he says, he's, he's, he's recounting his life and ministry. And in verse 4, he says something profound. He says, Father, I have glorified you on earth. Somewhat of a presumptuous statement. If you think that's a big one, listen to Jesus when he said, I always do what is pleasing to the Father. Wow. He's even more self-assured, unless it's based in fact, when he says, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished what you sent me here to do. Having accomplished what you sent me here to do. What is your greatest accomplishment in life? You would be surprised... How many folks, you ask that crucial question and they haven't got the foggiest? I would kind of think that's important, wouldn't you? To be able to say, okay, I've been on this planet this period of time and this is the most important thing I've done. What is your greatest accomplishment in life? You see, that question presupposes that you have identified your purpose. Because how can you accomplish something if you don't know what it is you're trying to get done? Make sense? And so, if, if in the words of Larry the Cable Guy, if we're going to get her done, we have to know what er is. Okay? As you can see, I'm highly read. Okay? George Strait, Casablanca, Clint Eastwood, and Larry the Cable Guy. That's why you pay me the big bucks. Okay? And so... It, it raises the question, if we're going to talk about what is, what is, if you and I are going to do an inventory and say, what's my greatest accomplishment? Well, I better know what my purpose is. And that's a question that seems to be gurgling in the hearts of a lot of people. Did you know that in the year 2002, there was a book written called The Purpose Driven Life? And that book had as its thesis a foundational question. It starts out with it. What on earth am I here for? And apparently, a lot of people are wrestling with that question because that book sold 35 million copies. What's my purpose? I have accomplished a sense of accomplishment. Now, if that's true for you and I individually, isn't it also true for us corporately? Therefore, let me ask this church, this family of faith, 
What are we accomplishing? Dramatic pause. That presupposes that we're able to identify our purpose, isn't it? That we are able to say, this is why we're here. This is what we're supposed to get done. And that is... Just surviving for 200 years is good, but not good enough. Status quo may be comfortable, sometimes preferable, rarely profitable. Paramount confidence is held tightly in the firm grasp of achievement. There's a third truth we can gain which will take us further along toward having paramount confidence in the ultimate crisis. And we're learning it from a man in his final moments when it's crunch time. And it's amazing as we study his wording here, verse 6, we saw the first principle, verse 7, the second, and now we go to verse 8, the third. It's very simple. It's moving right along in the passage. And in verse 8, Paul shares with us an awareness of security. This from a man who is about to die. He says in verse 8, in the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The irony of that situation strikes me amazingly. I want you to picture the scene. You're in a cold, dark, dank, stone cell. A gallows has been constructed outside your window. Tradition tells us Paul was probably beheaded by Nero. And so here's a man who knows that tomorrow he's going to lose his head and at the same time the Lord's going to put a crown on it. Does that strike you as kind of strange? And so what it says to me is we got a guy who is driving along to where on the bridge and he knows the bridge is out and says, I don't care because I know what's on the other side. You see, Paul is speaking about security that must mean something beyond this life. In fact, go on in your Bible to verse 18. And he says, here's a guy in prison. They're practicing, they're sharpening the blade. And he says, I'm about to die. And then in verse 18, he says, the Lord will deliver me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Paul, uh, just how do you define the term safely? You get what I'm saying? He's pointing out this irony of saying that the security that he has must be something beyond this life. More than a big house, a bank account, a life insurance policy, and a 401k. When I was a pastor at Waiole Hua'ia Church for 11 years, um, we had some folks that were in the church community before I got there and the whole time I was there and so forth and so on. And in that church, they didn't, have, they didn't call them elders, they called them deacons. During my time, we eventually instituted elders and we never had a deacon ex er, election again, but that's another story for another time. But anyway, um, Jack Hashimoto was one of our deacons when I first got there. Well, I didn't know anybody. It's sort of like me now. I don't know what goes on around here, and so I'm trying to figure it out in real time. And I've quickly discerned that Jack never came to church. He's one of those guys that show up once every Christmas or Easter or maybe or some other time during the year if there was a family gathering or something. And, and that was Jack, but he was one of the leaders of the church, and that seemed kind of odd to me. And uh, so then I remember discovering that Jack was more concerned with Budweiser than the Bible. And that helped explain a lot of things. But I had a great relationship with Jack. We got along well. Marvelous fisherman and so forth. Hawaiian Japanese guy, Jack Hashimoto. But during my 11-year tenure, while we were always very friendly, when Jack would go by in his truck, hey, brother, how you stay? But when I left, I left town. And I moved to the island of Oahu and became an evangelist, traveling full-time, come here sometimes. And Jack, of course, stayed back on the island of Kauai. 
But about eight months after I had moved to Oahu, Brenda is at work, I am not traveling that week, I am home, I get a phone call from his daughter, Ualani. And I said, hey, Ua, nice to speak with you. She said, kahu, kahu, the word for pastor. She said, dad is in Queens Hospital. They've flown him to Oahu. He's in Queens Hospital. And he's asking if you would come to the hospital and visit him. Now, generally speaking, when you leave a church, you don't keep involved. You, you need to honor that. But he's now on my island. So, of course, I get in my truck and I go down to Queens. And I walk into the room and as I see Jack there, the family are all gathered around. Jody and Ualani had told me that, uh, that he had lung cancer and it was very serious. And Dad wants to see you. So when I got in the room, he's all tubed up and beat, beat monitors and all of that. It was a very somber experience. And I went to see him and he said, Oh, Kahu, thank you for coming. Mahalo. And so as I gathered around his bed, I said, Jack, this is serious, isn't it? He said, yes. I said, Jack, this is crunch time, isn't it? And he said, yes. And I then, for the first time, had the opportunity to talk serious with Jack and to say that, it's, that you can have peace with God not by your relationship with the church or doing this, that, or the other, but by coming to grips with your own separation from God, realizing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and trusting not in yourself, not in your own philosophy, not in your own religion, but trusting on what Christ did on the cross and his love for you. I said, Jack, would you like to do that? Would you like to commit your life to Jesus Christ? Because it's crunch time. He's going to die. I told him. I said, Jack, you're going to die. He said, I know. Would you like to, to have peace with God? And Jack said, yes, go. And so I took his hand and grabbed the hands of his family, his ohana, and we prayed together and I shared Christ with Jack and he made a commitment to Christ. And when the prayer was over, or as we'd say in Hawaiian, when we were paupule, Jack looked up and with those Japanese Hawaiian eyes, brown face. The Hashimoto family, Brenda will know because she'll watch online later today. Not now at 3 in the morning. But the Hashimoto family have a very prominent jaw. And they have big teeth. And I remember as I looked down at Jack in his hospital bed and we finished the prayer, he opened his eyes and he looked up at me and that brown skin and those white teeth just flashed. And he said, oh, Kahu. I feel like a weight's been lifted off my chest. This, a chest racked with tumors. Where is your ultimate security and assurance? In life and in death. I have met many over the years who will say to me somewhat glibly, well, <laughs> I hope I get into heaven. <laughs> I hope I get into heaven. I'm always struck by the gravity of that comment because that's a pretty big gamble, isn't it? Eternity's a long time. They're rolling the dice on the most important reality ever. I hope I get into heaven. You can know you're going to heaven. Read 1 John. In the book of 1 John, there are seven direct references and 17 inferences. By this we know we are a child of God. By this we know we have eternal life. Not we hope, not we think, not we wish, not somebody else said. We know. In fact, so much so that in the year 2015, I came to this church and preached a revival from this spot for four sermons out of the book of 1 John entitled Salvation Evaluation, dealing with that very topic. Do you remember it? Don't you fib to me. 
All right, if that's the case, Jim Strickland, what did I preach last week? In fact, for that matter, what was the first point? And don't look at the screen. All right, we understand. We understand. But we can know. In fact, I've already quoted my mama. Can I quote her one more time? Because if I heard her say it, that simple woman with a mop in her hand, if I heard her say it 50 times, I heard her say it 500 times, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. What a gift she gave me and her husband and her children because we could look at her casket and say, no worries. It's all settled. Paramount confidence is held tightly in the firm grasp of the Savior's hand. Well, for five weeks, you've heard me tout confidence in the crisis. And I'm not so sure how you are convinced of the confidence part. But I am certainly clear that you have a grasp on the crisis aspect because COVID is here. Cancer is coming. The economic crash is right around the corner. Yeah, we get crises. And for five weeks, I've been telling you this fundamental truth that in Christ, we can have confidence in the crisis. Notice what Christ does not do. He does not spare us the crisis. He walks with us through the crisis. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. So I've shared with you two things that you have to place in your heart, and please don't forget them. Jesus is the source of confidence, and Jesus is sufficient for confidence. Well, I need to wrap up five weeks' worth of touting confidence in the crisis, in Christ. Let me try to say it simply. Hold on to your confidence. And when you can't do that, let your confidence hold on to you. Let's pray. Lord, the best way to hold on is to be held in your nail-scarred hand. Amen and amen. Let's all stand together. Thank you.
Here now again, the last words of that verse. You've got to love the fact that the Bible deals with real life and death. And so does our walk with Christ. Hear these last words. When ends, when ends life's passing dream, when death's cold threatening stream shall o'er me roll, blessed Savior then in love, fear and distrust remove. Oh, lift me safe above a ransomed soul. That's encouragement. That's confidence. That's accomplishment. Gracious God, in these moments now, we pray that you would send us forth with hope, with assurance, with promise, with victory, with a message to offer to others so desperately seeking. We believe that you are in the midst of this family of faith, and we pray again that you would move here in this church called Bex in ways that we do not expect, in ways that we do not predict, and in ways that we dare not restrict. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.